So I'm particularly happy to be here uh, today talking about teen health because during the last couple of weeks we've seen many teens who've really emerged as heroic leaders, inspiring the public and spurring action on gun control in the U.S. And in doing so, they've shown remarkable acts of bravery and strength. Today I want to talk about a type of hero that's similarly brave, strong, and inspiring, uh, though they might not be as visible. And these are teens with chronic conditions, um, chronic health conditions. So first I'm going to set the stage a little bit. Um, I'll be talking about adolescents in the U.S. today. Um, most of my talk will focus on the U.S., but I'm happy to discuss global trends and, and speak with people who are looking at uh, what healthcare looks like um, <clears throat> more globally after the talk. Uh, the good news is that most adolescents in the U.S. are considered healthy when we look at traditional medical measures like mortality rates, um, use of health services, and incidence of disease. And there's even more good news. Teens are smoking cigarettes less. They're drinking less than, than previous generations. Drunk driving has gone down. Um, teen pregnancy is at an all-time low. But the incidence and prevalence of chronic conditions is rising. Um, and this is true in most developed and developing countries. The World Health Organization predicts that chronic health conditions will constitute the main cause of death in adolescence by 2020, surpassing accidents and homicide. So we can see here kind of a staggering increase over an 18-year period, starting with 1994. I just put uh, data from two studies up here. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and these are results that might seem outdated, but the Office of Adolescent Health gives 31% as its current estimate uh, for the number of adolescents who have at least one chronic condition. Uh, so I chose these two because they're reliably comparable studies. Uh, and, it, and it show generally uh, the increase. It's also estimated that 13% of adolescents have two or more conditions. Um, so thinking about what it means to be an adolescent today uh, might be different from what it used to mean. Much of the increase in chronic health conditions is from some co common chronic problems. So these relate to mental health and learning, particularly ADD and ADHD. Uh, but depression and anxiety are on the rise. So for example, these charts show the prevalence of major depressive episodes in 2014 for adolescents on the top um, and young adults on the bottom. So on the y-axis we have percentage and it's truncated at 12, so this looks much more alarming than it actually is on first glance. Um, but I include these to sort of show that the trend is going up. Um, so episodes rose in 2014 from under 9% in 2005 to 11% in, in 2014 in adolescents, um, with, a, with a modest increase in young adults as well from 2005 to 2014. So while this is only one measure of mental health, it's an important signal that indicates a trend. Asthma is another driver of, of chronic illnesses in adolescents. Um, between uh, 1976, so going a little bit further back now, uh, to uh, 2016, and we can see it going from under 4% in, uh, in the 96, uh, seven, <coughs> excuse me, 76 to 80 uh, period to uh, 1 in 10 in 2016. The final large driver is obesity or being overweight. So obesity rates have more than tripled uh, from under 6% in 1980 to roughly 21% in 2015 to 16. Uh, so fortunately, not all chronic illnesses cause severe disruption to daily life or limit activity. But when we look across different conditions that do limit activity in teens, uh, we can see that overall these are also increasing. So going back a little further now to 1960, we see that adolescents with special health care needs were under about 2% of the population. Uh, this is increasing to, in 2010, reach over 15%. Um, so I show these as background slides to show that teens will be engaging in healthcare differently. Um, in the past, supporting teen health meant teaching teens to avoid things like smoking, drinking, risky sexual behavior, and cultivating self-care skills. But teens are having more difficulties now with chronic illnesses and basic self-care. So we need to think about management as a strategy and uh, how computing can support that rather than just prevention. Um, so let's put kind of a face on this uh, and, and introduce you to a persona who represents a type of teen that, that I work with a lot. I'd like to introduce you to Bren. So Bren is 15. 
She's just been diagnosed with osteosarcoma. So this is a type of cancer that occurs in the long bones, like our arms and our legs. Um, and so she's considered to have a complex chronic condition. She'll wrestle with it for at least 12 months. She'll require specialty pediatric care and some period of hospitalization. Um, <clears throat> so Brenda lies on her family, um, and they are really the ones who end up coordinating her care, taking her to visits, uh, calling in to the clinic when they're concerned. And Brenda is also experiencing kind of normal social developmental stuff. So she's finding friends with interests that are similar to hers. She's cultivating her identity, um, getting involved in projects that are interesting to her. And most of the time, she just wants to be treated like a normal 15-year-old. Since her diagnosis, her life, her parents' lives have completely changed. Um, she has to miss school. Her mom or dad might leave work early for routine hospital visits and doctor appointments. And she's sort of navigating now these two worlds. Communication and coordination can be extremely complex. So uh, I kind of put a stand in here for an oncologist, but this actually represents an entire network of caregivers, um, nurses, radiologists, um, child life specialists. So Bren had a clean bill of health uh, before her diagnosis, so she's likely to have a good outcome with treatment. But she'll need to engage in follow-up activities over a period of many years. She might encounter some survivorship effects. These have long-term impacts on uh, digestive health, reproductive health. And she'll be dealing with these potentially uh, throughout her life. So we have a challenge, right? Bren is developing into an adult. She's dependent on her parents, but she's ramping up her autonomy. Teens in this case are often treated as either young ch younger children or adults. Their perspectives on the illness are really essential to capture, right, and directly drive treatment decisions. They need to be involved about decisions like, should I get surgery? Do I need to get something amputated? While we don't think about navigating the healthcare system as a skill that teens need to learn, um, in fact, we're seeing that with uh, the higher prevalence in chronic illness, one in three will start to need to learn this, right, uh, during their teenage years. So how can HCI help Bren um, and teens like her? Well, we conducted a field study at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta where we conducted uh, 38 interviews, observations of consultations. We interviewed parents and teens separately. That was really important for us methodologically. And we found some clear directions for design. So I'll, I'll highlight some that pertain to the rest of the talk, uh, many more in the paper that I'm citing, and happy to, to share that if you're interested. But first, teens in our study needed to take gradual ownership of healthcare needs, and they weren't necessarily uh, seeing a lot of opportunity to do that. There's a lot of things that this comprises, but one of the things I'll point to today is recognizing and communicating their experiences. This tended to be extremely difficult for them. So we saw that both teens and parents needed private communication channels with clinicians. And they often tried to kind of protect one another from the emotional distress that came with talking about difficult illness experiences. So teens' shielding of information typically manifested as hiding symptoms from parents, not wanting to surprise or worry them, and not wanting to delay them, because they knew how busy they were and how, how many things they would have to do uh, and balance, as well as sort of take them into a clinic and, and receive care. The other important finding here is that teens struggle to make sense of their diagnosis, their health status, and their progress. And one of the key things that we saw here is that they used diagnostic data whenever they could and compared diagnostic data over time um, to help them understand status and progress. So we see a couple selected quotes. There are many that came up in our study. But they said things like, I want to see how my platelets have gotten better over time how my MRIs have changed over time. Or in T10's case, these scans make me feel a little bit like I'm in there. I can see the tumor they point out, so I can see what's wrong with me. They don't have to tell me in some weird way. Another big takeaway from the study was that caregivers, both clinical and family, family members, had difficulty understanding the patient experience. And the teens that we studied really tired of being probed with questions. So we heard things like, a lot of times, I really don't want to talk to them about how I'm doing. The biggest question I hated being asked is, are you OK? How are you feeling? 
I'm fine until you come in here asking me all of these questions. Um, so talking about experiences was the most challenging part of communication with physicians for the, for the parents that we spoke with. And teens found it really difficult too. So with these in mind, let's look at sort of two major directions for HCI research um, that can start to address how computing can make things a little bit easier for Brett and her family. So I see these relating to socio-technical systems and personal systems. When I talk about socio-technical systems, I'll talk about systems that, uh, that manage data and, uh, and some of the complications inherent in creating and um, maintaining those systems. So first, we need to understand the socio-technical context that creates constraints around coordination and communication and ultimately Bren's participation, her ability to uh, own these data. A lot of health data will be generated during Bren's care and her everyday life. So how can we use this data to promote family coordination, engagement, and knowledge? This is harder than it sounds because there's a lot of assumptions about these data that we can't necessarily make. And I'll go into to what these are in a little bit. So the other kind of major direction I see is relating to, uh, is basically re related to personal systems. So how do we design personal systems to tackle some of the problems that we talked about? When we do design, we have to think about things like participatory um, approaches differently. For example, we have to consider the needs of the family, we have to treat the family as a unit in the design process, and we have to understand what kinds of design insights can we really get um, uh, from a family who is going through this. So first, kind of looking at uh, socio-technical systems, Bren will have an electronic health record. She might have several. And what 20 years of medical informatics and HCI research has taught us is that we can engage patients better by providing them information about their own health in a way that they can easily understand. Many people have direct access to health data now through personal health records or online patient portals. So working with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, we did a mixed method study. So we investigated experiences accessing an online health record portal uh, that contained teens' health records. Portal here means it included also some other features like uh, not, not only diagnostic test results and notes, but things like electronic messaging, appointment scheduling, uh, visit, uh, visit reviews, and uh, um, medication um, prescription uh, refills. So both patients and parents could access it if they both gave permission. And we wanted to know if after logging in and using it for a while, would parents and teens have different experiences using it? So we audited 19 months of usage, and we followed up with surveys and interviews. And I have three selected survey questions here. We found that teens agreed slightly more than their parents that using the system would lead them to ask questions or had led them to ask questions that they wouldn't have known to ask before, uh, that they knew more about their health, and they found it less difficult to keep track of information in the system. Um, and, and this was interesting for us because most of the work that has looked at um, online engagement with health record portals and health records in general has focused on older audiences. So we're seeing that, uh, that the younger audience um, was more receptive to use of these health record systems in general. But when we presented this work at a medical informatics conference, we learned that access to this kind of data and the access that our study participants had isn't necessarily the norm. Some of this has to do with laws governing confidentiality, but not all. So federal laws mandate confidential health services for federally funded dependents. So no electronic trail can betray that confidentiality. But privacy laws vary at the state level, and they're sometimes ambiguous about whether adolescents can actually control personal information, even about whether they consent, they can consent, excuse me, to uh, receiving particular treatments. So to sum up, it's an ambiguous age, but systems have to embody unambiguous rules about access to electronic health records and, and online portal features. So several professional organizations have called for improvements to the design of health IT to address privacy challenges. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics said health inform information systems currently lack the capability to allow for protection 
of the privacy and security of health information for minors. And this has been echoed by other professional societies. So we teamed up with researchers at Cornell, Jessica Anker and Marianne Charco, to characterize the diversity in adolescent portal policies across a range of institutions and determine the factors that kind of influence decision making about um, how to actually implement and customize health record systems um, at an institutional level. So we conducted semi-structured interviews with chief medical information officers and other health IT administration executives. And we complemented our interview data with survey data from CMIOs across the country at centers that both serve pediatric populations and have EHRs deployed to manage patient data. So our goal was to kind of maximize the diversity uh, of uh, the, the geography and the type of medical organization. So we use census regions for stratification. Looking, you know, so these are sort of how they cluster according to census regions. When we look at them by zip code, we see the actual distribution across the US. And so we, we do see some skew. Uh, for example, uh, California is overrepresented. Um, we asked questions about what EHR privacy features were implemented, their decision making process, whether they needed guidance, and their general experience. The big takeaway here is that policies established very different degrees of adolescent access, from none to partial to complete, uh, access ages from 10 to 18 years, degrees of parental access, and types of information considered sensitive. So our first takeaway is that there's a lot of variability. We found that it wasn't necessarily variability that made sense. So for hospitals that saw a lot of chronic conditions with, where family co-management is really important, Sometimes you'd see policies like, well, no access. When they turn 13, we, we just lock them out. There's, there's no online record available. So this chart combines results from both studies, and we've clustered it by all possible ages at which an institution could give access. So if you look across medical centers in our studies and ask what age are adolescents granted full access or, or full access with parental permission, it looks something like this. Um, each possible age, 10 to 18, is listed on the left there. The color is red if the medical organization does not grant access, green if they do, and purple if they allow access but only with permission. So if it's half green and half red, it means that half of the medical centers in our study would allow someone who's, say, 13 to access their online health record, and half would not. I like this because it kind of shows um, where adolescents get pulled, right? So um, depending on um, where you would go to seek care, you might be pulled in a very different direction, right? Um, to either receive or not receive access to your online record. And it becomes really clear where the muddy area is. Um, so we kind of can see the ambiguity really easily here. Yeah? I'm wondering about intent here. Is this, they just didn't, it's like, it's a thing that they haven't thought about. What, is, they, is there a broader theory around this? Like, you know, why not give them access, for example? Right. What's the threat? I'll go into mentioned? that in a little bit, yeah. So we didn't have, we didn't find a theoretical grounding for this. We did find that, that state law, we, so we figured that state law would really dictate policy. Um, it was not the primary contributor to, to policies. Um, but Addressed, but the inconsistency is problematic, right? Um, so we want to prevent inadvertent breaches of privacy. We need adolescent and parental trust in the medical system. So you can imagine that people are going to feel really frustrated, right? If at one point they have the record and then uh, something that uh, was transparent and available all of a sudden is, is unavailable. But when we look at rationale for why, we found that concerns about confidentiality and discussion of sensitive health topics were the key things that led, uh, that, that led medical centers to sort of lock down records. So one organization cited the pressure of parents demanding access to teens' passwords as the reason uh, for not having any portal um, access during adolescence. So in interview two, we learned you know, allowing access could set up a vertical hierarchy in terms of the pressures coming from the parents that adolescents give them their passwords. So ultimately, we put it to bed and said, there just isn't any access. 
But for those who locked both parties out, it was lack of controls of the system that was problematic. So they don't have the fine grained access controls that they need to mark certain things private um, without them automatically populating the portal. Um, so in some, in some sense, you know, not populating it because you can't be sure that it'll, it'll be populated with compromising information or, or, or uh, that it would betray privacy, in some sense that's a good idea, right? Because you're reducing risk. And prior research shows that teens uh, will actually avoid seeking care if there's a fear uh, for certain types of care, um, if there's a fear that there will be an electronic or paper trail. Um, so it sort of solves a problem, but what ends up happening is that many medical centers will choose an age at which neither the parent nor the child can access the record or have any portal features available. Um, and so this is severely disruptive to families who are kind of co-managing a chronic illness um, or to uh, who teens who, for, for teens who feel that they need electronic access in order to schedule appointments, right, and, and have private online communications with their, with their doctors. What's really frustrating too from an HCI point of view is that we don't know how parents or teenagers really feel about this. So this is one of the first studies that has even investigated uh, this phenomenon. Um, so you know, th there are some focus group studies that look at attitudes towards health records, um, but we still need to do a lot of work to figure out um, what, what do we need for, uh, to advance kind of the consistency and create tools that medical centers could use uh, to have the fine grain access control that they need and the end user, right, have, have the fine grain access and sharing controls that, the, that they need. So fortunately, other informants told us that they saw the medical record as a communication tool. Um, so in interview eight, we learned that their guiding principle is the medical record is a communication tool between patients and their doctors. To limit the availability of information just doesn't make sense. And some put a lot of additional work into configuring portal access to accommodate a range of health needs, uh, to use it as a learning tool. So we want to go back to them, learn the specifics of how they did this, and see if we can use these insights to inform policies and design work related to Im improving multi-party controls going forward. OK, so let's move on now to personal systems and opportunities um, in this space. So I'll discuss work from two recent papers. Uh, we talked about the importance of making sense of health status and progress in the clinic. We talked about how patients like Bren will undergo lots of imaging studies. Radiology exams are a way to make sense of health status and treatment progress. So it might be natural to think that we can help patients engage better um, if we make radiology data available. Now, there are several reasons why this could be really challenging to do uh, with radiology data. It's different from other diagnostic data like lab results. Lab results are more constrained in nature. They have these kind of single point measures. They're well defined and straightforward in terms of uh, ranges of what's normal. The radiology report corresponds to image data that is thousands of cross-sectional slices of an anatomical region and a text report written by radiologists who are interpreting these images. By default, these aren't really meant to be understood by patients. So just like lab results and other medical data, it still uh, can be released, at, at least uh, for those centers that do allow access. Um, and it's really important to them. So we asked how we can design tools to improve medical communication about radiology imaging studies for pediatric patients and their family members. We situated um, our work in, in the clinic. We conducted an analysis of online health forum data to gauge patients' information needs related to imaging reports. Everything from length of questions and answers to stylistic considerations um, and how they ask questions and explain things to each other. We ran some basic text analytics on over 200,000 radiology reports to distill the common phrases and also some unique phrases. We had seven radiologists review these to get a better understanding of what functions these phrases really served in the report. So in other words, certain phrases uh, can commonly be used to either refer to anatomy, uh, describe attributes about that anatomy, the size of something or position of something. Others indicated that there, were, there was absence or a presence of something. Um, and then of course there were follow-up suggestions. So we paid attention to actions and recommendations versus observations. 
And we used some of these insights to design a web application with a touch-based user interface that was formatted for interaction on a Microsoft Surface tablet and designed to handle written content of a CT or MRI study and ran a pilot study. Um, and I'll talk a little bit uh, in a minute about why we chose to do this uh, on a tablet. When I present the results, I think it'll, it'll be a, a little bit clearer. So our goals, based on, our, on the first two small studies we, collect, we conducted, uh, were to identify and restructure important sections of the report. We were able to use heuristics to determine structural features of the report that helped us to sort of automatically restructure it. And we also wanted to allow users to identify medical concepts and important sections of interest. So we connected to Medline Plus and other um, health communication APIs to search for terms and auto link explanations to allow them to sort of clarify jargon if they wanted to, but within the clinical context. And then, of course, we wanted to allow them to select any portion of the report um, and associate that portion with questions um, and discussion topics, but also in context. So, So this is going a little bit fast, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, you can see all, all of the prior exams are on the left um, in this demo. Um, so while we conducted the pilot study on tablet computers, uh, this video was shot on a desktop. So you'll see a mouse doing the, the actual selection. Uh, but the, the selections you see are also uh, enabled through touch. So you can see exams on the left, choose which report to interact with, and information cards load on the right. These have illustrations and text for medical definitions, uh, allow interaction with a 3D anatomical model, and it'll localize on that model um, the, uh, the, the textual uh, reference. We wanted to allow for definitions even of things that weren't medical phrases, and also allow for some alternative ways of saying something. So otherwise unremarkable is something that comes up a lot, and we, we wanted to be able to uh, clarify what this means, right, using, using multiple definitions. So content from info cards is automatically made available uh, to add to a user's notepad where they can ask questions in the context of their browsing. And navigation is structured such that uh, a summary is shown after some basic information of what the exam is. So since we know to look for things like size and, and position of text, we are also able to add reference measures uh, for sizing information to give, people, um, to give people a more concrete view of what that might be. So we ran a pilot study with patients, parents, and oncologists at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, um, where we, we acquired the most recent CT scan or MRI. Um, and in most cases, the scan was conducted right there. So uh, once the, the scan was conducted and the report was completed, we sort of ran it by the oncologist and subsequently loaded it into our prototype. Several Patients and parents told us that they liked kind of being able to quickly retrieve lay-friendly explanations. What they really liked is that they didn't need to filter the quality of the search. Uh, so this is still a big deal. Uh, medical information search is really difficult for consumers. Things tend to be either really watered down and focused on safe information um, that won't get the company publishing it in trouble or overly technical literature. So this is still actually, actually a really active area of research. Um, so T13 summed this up well. And when saying that it helps a lot, before you'd have to go to Google or another search engine just to look this up. T12 told us that notes would help him keep track of follow-up instructions. And so again, thinking about this in the context of wanting to foster self-care skills, tools like this can be really useful. In the clinic, interaction with the report actually led to this really interesting dynamic interspersing of report interaction by both patients, parents, and clinicians. Um, but we found that by giving the teen a tablet, right, and, and 
allowing them to sort of drive the experience, the discussions focused on them more so than asking the parent and sort of, you know, every now and then kind of checking with the teen. Um, the conversations and discussions were much more patient-centered. Just from giving a tablet with this uh, diagnostic data and, and some tools to the teen. We found that discussions started out focusing on technical concepts and sort of defining what was what, but then patients and parents drew on this technical knowledge and really quickly to start asking about other things, symptoms, disease process, treatment. Um, and when answering questions, clinicians demonstrated certain visuospatial concepts by alternating between sketching, physically referencing areas of their bodies and the patient's bodies, and we observed two of the five oncologists in our pilot study sketching out relevant parts of, uh, on the body, on, drawing, on the drawing board, on, on bed sheets. So it started with some electronic information retrieval, right, driven by the patient, turned into kind of this rich patient-driven discussion with the doctor. Um, so in, in the paper, we mentioned a lot more uh, findings, but one of the things that we were really excited about was going from something, from an electronic interaction to then of some in-person interactions that included a lot more than just clicking and looking something up and, and instead took the turn of uh, gesturing uh, for explanation and sketching. So in ongoing work, we want to develop tech, more text analytic capabilities to highlight and rank elements of previous reports that relate to a span of user-selected text uh, for any selected span of text in a report and to show targeted comparisons because patients were really relying on these heavily to understand progress over time. So now on to a final study I'll talk about, a co-design study. Yeah. A quick question. Like, I was wondering how that might destabilize the broader system. Like, um, not being an expert in medical informatics, my sense is that doctors often view part of their role is to control the flow of information, um, which is why you know patients who come in <laughs> Googling every which symptom and have 10 million different theses about what's going on can be frustrating. It's sort of yeah. like, no, I. I'm the one who's trained in taking in all this information and, right. and synthesizing it into a result. And I wonder if you know this thing that you that you're talking that you presented destabilizes that relationship in a way that would be viewed as threatening to the doctor, where they no longer sort of have control over the the conversation or the information that's being presented to the patient. Like, yeah, so I think uh, it, it didn't come up. Um, so overall, the oncologists we worked with were um, so there's a couple reasons why though, right? So it didn't come up, but when we do research studies like this, um, physicians are an important part of the recruitment process. So we don't we can't necessarily go in and, and just sample randomly, right? We have to work with uh, usually the in, in this case it would be the the oncologist that has the oncologist that has a, a relationship with the patient and make sure that they're sort of helping us select patients who are good quote unquote good candidates. Usually, what this means is that the patient is stable enough um, and the information communicated wouldn't be so sensitive that you really shouldn't be delivering it electronically. Um, but that also affects then who has access to this kind of data. So it could be that we didn't hear about it because they were part of sort of the selection of who got it. That said, I don't know if we could have done it any differently because when you do studies like this, you sort of have to rely on their, um, uh, on their direction. So, but it's a great question, yeah. Was there a chance that um, it could have been replaced existing EHR systems? like when you were interviewing the doctors or because I, so I've, I've done some stuff in this space and the, do, the doctors I talked to were very um, not, they did not like the idea at all because they thought it was handing over control to the patients and basically the issues that Michael brought up. Um, huh. And so, so I wonder like when you were presenting this, were you presenting it in a way to, to where this wouldn't like replace like my health with Epic but it okay. could be an, like an additional system. Right, okay, I think I, I, think I understand the question. Um, yeah, so this was absolutely not to replace any kind of face-to-face -face, you know, clinician-patient interaction. Um, our goal was actually to supplement that communication. Um, and so first of all, we envision this as being used in the clinic and probably in a supervised way. Um, when there aren't necessarily changes that would distress the patient, you could do this before the consultation. And that was one of the use cases that um, the, uh, the oncologist that we worked with actually suggested to us. Um, but this is absolutely for uh, you, you know, supplementation, right, not, not replacement. Um, 
I think you know they were excited about it because, um, as I kind of mentioned before, a lot of the educational tools really aren't. You know, adolescence is such an ambiguous age, and people have a hard time gauging what's too much, right? So um, a lot of the explanatory materials are, are really geared towards younger children. And so those just sort of don't work with teens. And so having something electronic, something that can uh, show them, right, uh, what's going on inside your body, right, in a way that is a little bit more concrete, but that can be scaffolded through the communication that happens with the clinicians, um, they saw as overall very positive. But again, um, it's not going to work for every patient. I think that it's a really great question. So moving on to uh, personal systems, I'll talk about a final study uh, today on co-design. My final study, I should say, today uh, is co-design uh, with teens with complex chronic illnesses. So this relates to a different type of health data. It's clinically relevant. But uh, it comes from the patient directly. So uh, we are exploring ways of capturing symptom data. So after Bren's diagnosis, for example, she'll start chemotherapy. And within a few days of the initial treatment, she'll need to get several lab tests, including baseline blood work. And what will be happening is during the course of treatment, um, her, the chemo is going to be delivered to destroy cancer cells in the body. But some of the body's normal cells are also going to be damaged in the process. So once chemo starts, as one side effect, the patient's blood count level is going to decrease dramatically. And then it'll shoot back up to normal range. So that's this, this red curve here. So this is important to track because it's a sign of the patient's immune system. And the blood counts dictate when the patient can receive their next chemo treatment. It usually takes about three to four weeks to fully rec recover blood count levels. And so every patient kind of responds differently to a chemo agent. And so they're asked to come back a week or two after the first treatment so the care team can kind of evaluate the patient's tolerance, make adjustments to the therapy um, based on kind of the measured difference between baseline, which would be T0 in this, um, in this chart, and T1. So during this three to four week period, a patient can experience symptoms and treatment effects. And it's important to capture these to understand if this is actually a successful course of treatment or if it can be successful or if we need to change course. But let's take this image, for example. Imagine being a parent of this child and having to figure out what's going on. Um, and, and they're not really opening up to you, in part because they're suffering some of the cognitive effects, right? the, the physical and emotional distress of having just gone through their first chemo treatment. So is he in pain? Is he just fatigued? Is he distressed? Some things are visible, right? But other things are not as visible. And while patients are recovering from treatment, there's a significant time lapse between the last day of a chemo infusion and the doctor's visit. This can range from about two to three weeks. And symptoms can take many forms right during this time um, and will be most severe, actually, between visits just at the time when you're probably less likely um, to be uh, thinking about talking to the doctor because you have another visit coming up in a couple weeks. So oncologists need to get a clear understanding of the patient's status. And they'll use radiology scans, blood tests, but they also really heavily rely on patient self-reports about current effects of treatment dosage on the body. And they also use this for uh, supportive care opportunities, right? so to, to refer when necessary, to a nutritionist, um, uh, to a psychiatrist. So while clinical data are easily obtained, it's really difficult to get self-reported data about the illness experience and incorporate that into care processes. So what we found, and what's been echoed in other studies, is that parents tend to over-report and teens tend to under-report. Um, and so this is it's a very difficult and, uh, and under-investigated topic. So we're investigating ways now of capturing patients' health assessments during that time between um, visits to the clinic outside of typical care context to address problems with recall um, and reconciliation between the parent and the teen. So this co-design study asked how we can support teens' communication of their everyday illness experiences. And I'm referring here to elicitation of these experiences. So fortunately, researchers have created a framework 
for capturing observations of daily living. So this is patient-defined and patient-generated data. Status indicators would be how they're feeling. And this could be uh, physical as well as emotional. Behavioral indicators, what they've been doing, what they've been up to. And exposures pertain to socio-environmental context. So we wanted to understand if we could use this framework um, and elicit these you know, types of everyday illness experiences. But we needed to turn some of these, right, make it a little bit more concrete, and turn them into design artifacts to facilitate some visual storytelling. So we co-designed visual observations of daily living, which ended up being a library of visual illustrations depicting multiple aspects of the patient's lived experience. So up till now, we've kind of been talking about delivery of data and user-driven questions about data that's sort of already there. Um, but when we're designing with teens right, in this space to elicit information from them, we have a lot of different challenges. And so I've kind of outlined them here. First, building off of ideas, which is something we usually want to do in, in a design process, in our case means building on experience. We have to capture the experience, too. Um, and often, the experience that they've, that they've had, um, their histories, right, their experience of the illness, directly corresponds to their ideas. Um, many ideas are related to physical experiences. And after all, in this case, we also want to design something to continue to capture those. So reconciling teen and parent reports about the experience is difficult. There's unequal power relationships. There's reduced means for communicating ideas. Uh, design work can be burdensome. And there's kind of a complex web of additional stakeholders that we have to account for. So there's been some exciting design research um, that has helped us understand how to engage in co-design with uh, kids and teens. We learned, for example, that teens' understanding of their role and really what, what is their role in this design process, not just kind of, hmm, we want you to do a design activity, right, without having a clear vision for what that means, uh, but really knowing how are they going to contribute to the outcome, what is their role here, is important. Re-examining what objectives should be, so not just coming up with a solution at the end, but understanding the value of the entire process. Um, making the engagement in that process one of the outcomes is really important. And treating child designers as actually co-researchers, right? They're, they help us right, research, um, gather data, share, and enrich the contextual data that we need. And so this is some exciting work that's also um, coming to the fore. And work on designing with the family um, has recently looked at relationship building as part of doing design. So accounting for um, what are the dynamics here? And having the designer sort of be able to recognize when some of those, design, uh, when, when some of those dynamics are at play. So when disagreements uh, might be happening that would require that we shift, right, and that we pivot a design activity. So we generated sketches that patients could use, but we also sketched with them. They could draw or tell us what to draw. And we did this both alone with them and with family members present. They could indicate things that they wouldn't show their families. Um, and before inviting other stakeholders in, we made sure to, to uh, give them a means for sort of marking, this would just be for me, this is something I would want to share, and I'll tell you how in, in just a minute. So we based activities or these behavioral indicators on um, activities of daily living, self-care, quality of life, eating, bathing, et cetera. Um, Teens let us know that, uh, teens in our study let us know that they wanted some status uh, indicators right there within the design of these different artifacts to let us know this is something I can't do or this is something I can do really well. So for them, tracking activities and engagement in activities was a really important part of being able to communicate about the illness experience itself. Um, and so we kind of created this library. Some of, some of these things included people, places, and finally, descriptors and tools. So, Tools described a set of media technologies that the teen could bring into uh, a storyboard. We used storyboard scaffolding to kind of outline their observations of daily living. We specifically presented four scenarios to draw out illness-related experiences and preferences regarding imagined use of a technology that could help them capture these experiences in situ. So these included storyboarding for personal review, communicating with family members, in person and remotely, 
and communicating with uh, their doctors. I want to point out that this is different from storyboard scaffolding approaches such as comic boarding that start in the beginning with a few pre-selected images to support idea generation but then leave the rest open-ended. We actually replace the end frames uh, with visual illustrations to correspond to a scenario that, that they could be grounded in so that they sort of knew up front, OK, uh, this would be the story that then I would be either sharing in person or sharing electronically. So I'll just talk about our second and third scenarios now. I won't have time to go into all of them. But our second and third scenarios pursued insights into how family members could work together to contribute observations as part of the patient's experience. So I'm going to combine uh, the, the findings that I'd like to highlight today from both in-person and remote communication. Parents became involved in co-design to contribute their own observations and perspectives. And we saw opportunities for storyboarding technology to resolve conflicting perspectives. So for example, T9 said, tracking these observations of daily living could serve as a point of reference to resolve discrepant recollections excuse me, of an observed experience. So he said, my memory's not been the best recently with all the stuff that's going on. So usually it would be me saying something what I believe is correct, and she'll see it some other way. And if I did record what happened, we could just go back and look at that, and that would help a lot. When we asked interview questions about what each teen and parent understood best about the patient experience, teens focused on describing personally felt experiences. These are both physical and emotional. And how those affected the activities that they wanted to do every day. Parents talked more about meta-level details, timing of things, location, frequency. So we heard teens saying, I'm, if I'm talking about pain or symptoms, those would be more of a personal thing. Only you know how much it really hurts and all that. It'd be harder to explain it to someone else. I think she, referring to his parent, um, his mom, be better at tracking the time than me. T13 ha echoed something similar. He said, I would ask my mom to record me after I'm done sitting down, how I feel when I'm brushing my teeth, what music does for me, and how I feel. So studies like this are contributing to an emerging space of family informatics. So tracking the direct felt experience is important. Tools should elicit input from both children and family caregivers. Laura Pina found that families with both healthy kids and kids with chronic conditions preferred to consider both caregivers and children as trackers to distribute the burden of tracking uh, among the family and to also look at ripple effects, right? So how was a behavior or um, a, uh, for example, a, an emotional experience affecting others in the family? How we do this is an open question. We could do it really, really poorly, um, and it could go wrong. Um, but uh, it's an emerging area that I think has promise. Many patients describe themselves as the experiencer of their own subjective feelings, while parental caregivers mention tracking objective details, time, location, frequency. So digital storyboarding technology could support collaborative work among families by providing kind of distinct roles. What should you fill in right, for each stakeholder? Um, so I'll wrap up with scenario four. Going from scenarios one to four, we found that types of digital media technology that they wanted to use to capture some of these experiences uh, change depending on what they were capturing, of course. Uh, the paper kind of goes into some of these relationships. But often this had to do with the expressive potential of different media and what they wanted to, to um, uh, capture. So teens' preferences for communicating mood were quite mixed. We found that they were very fluent. Um, they were very fluent with sketching, and they were very fluent with uh, communicating on the storyboard about mood, though they didn't necessarily talk about it very much. Um, but because of the complexity of emotions requiring rich representations, we found in our analysis of interviews and photos of storyboards that teens preferred a mix of both abstract and concrete representations, different facial expressions, as well as sometimes uh, tracking something, what, what they consider to be quantitative. One out of five, how am I feeling today? And to define that scale themselves. <clears throat> So T7 described um, wanting to use a chart along with a photo taken on his phone. You see my highs and lows, mood swings, happen almost every day. And uh, needing a mix of tools with, that allowed for different attributes of the experience to be captured. 
We also saw that they found videos to be engaging for them and thought they'd be engaging for clinicians. So T5, for example, was optimistic about the potential for video to foster more positive patient-clinician interactions that were driven by the patient. Saying, next time I come in, the nurses could be like, that was such a cool video of your foot. So what does it mean, right, to sort of think about the capabilities that we need? Um, and what does it mean to train clinicians to handle the way that this group expresses themselves? Right, so this is a question that we're tackling in my group. We have a lot more um, on our website. So I'll wrap up now. I want to thank my awesome graduate students. I made Matt Hong a little bit larger here because he was the first author on many of the studies that I mentioned today. Um, and also thank some funding sources. Discussion. Um, so, like, how do you? I'm still not clear. Like, how do you balance the um, the issue of security and privacy that you mentioned in the first part of your talk with like having children becoming co-designers and researchers at the same time? Because there's a issue with like the younger they are, the less um, we want to or hospitals want to give them. Um, access to the records and uh, the data that they could potentially co-design with. But, so I guess, like, how do you balance those two conflicts? I think that's an excellent question. Um, and I think that's something that, that we're hoping to investigate a lot more. Um, certainly, things change when you think about collecting data from a patient. If they can't access, if they can't access the electronic health record, but you're still expecting them to contribute to it, um, that creates a lot of problems in terms of visibility and being able to kind of go and correct things. Um, so I think, you know, working through what consistency means and access to adolescent records is going to be really important. Um, so we're doing this design work as research because we, we see it have, playing a really important role. Um, but yeah, we do need to work out some, some of the, uh, the consistency issues. And we're hoping that we can start pushing policy in the direction of more consistency. That is an area that is very new to me. So, uh, so if you guys have insights into sort of HCI meeting policy, uh, let me know, because I think this is a really important gap to fill. <laughs> what do you see as the role of your technology and how you're designing in preparing the children and doing medical research at a more adult level. Because I'm looking back at like my progression, I didn't have any of these tools, but I think maybe not having those tools meant I was more ready to kind of interpret a radiology report by reading up to date or Medscape or something like that, where like going between different um, medical systems, they might not have these interactive tools that you have. So what, what yes. is the education component? Yeah, so I, I see two questions there that I think are really interesting. Um, so the first, so I think the first question is, if you give people tools, are they less likely to sort of build some of those skills themselves? If you're basically encapsulating some of those, those skills in a tool that um, provides some of that for them, right? Then you're, you're potentially, you're potentially robbing them of opportunities to assess quality, let's say, of online materials themselves. Um, or to do some of the some active research themselves, where have, they have to think through what kinds of concepts they need to learn about, right, and get information about. And I think that's an open question. Um, this is also true, though, in medicine in general. So um, a lot of the the systems that we have now, um, in recommending treatments or in um, uh, there's benefits, right, of of, of alarm systems. There's benefits of um, clinical decision support, but there's also potential negative impacts when we rely too much on those systems um, in terms of our own cognition and our own ab ability to solve problems. So I, I think that's a really important question. And I don't necessarily know. I think we need to kind of look at it, right, and, and maybe compare different groups and how they problem solve um, to see what are the benefits of different approaches. The other question, I think, relates to disparities. So imagine that you know, if an adolescent just doesn't have access to the record, but you're creating tools that help adolescents who do, right, then you have this effect of you know, even more resources given to people who already have them. Um, and so you know, I think disparities is something that we also need to address in health informatics and um, 
I'm attending a CCC workshop on that next week, so I'm hoping to learn more about that. But it's definitely, you know, reflecting on some of our work, it's like, yes, this will work great for kids who are already in, who already have access to organizations who have thought really carefully about how to provide records and who want them to have these learning, you know, these learning materials and tools. So, um, but then you're sort of, uh, you're basically making the disparity dichotomy even more pronounced through continuing to innovate for the group that has resources. So these are really good questions. All right, take your burning questions up to the front. Uh, Learn will be here. Thanks again. Thanks.